Well, hello to everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for your participation in this series of discussion on cultural heritage in crisis. Um, the Initiative on Religion, Law and Diplomacy at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and Foreign Affairs Institute, Greece, are organizing this uh, series of conversation to explore the current conditions and contours of cultural heritage in, cri in crisis, framing frame it with, uh, within this context of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, the conversation series brings together cultural heritage experts, policymakers, practitioners, and influencers to share knowledge, experiences, and recommendations about sustainable cultural heritage practices at a moment of great risk and at a time of a renewed possibility. Uh, the first conversation of this series was about why does cultural heritage matter for humanity? And the participants were Dr. Bonnie Doherty from Harvard Law School, who is specialized in world heritage and armed, co armed conflict, and Dr. Marius Notas, head of the European Communications Institute based in, based in Athens, Greece. Moderator was uh, Dr. Elizabeth Prodromu from Tufts University, a true pillar of this effort. And at this point, I would like to thank her and her team, Sisi, Francois, and Brad, for all their effort to the realization of this event. Today, we will discuss public-private partnerships, social impact investing, and cultural heritage. And to do so, we have uh, with us three important experts on their field, whom I will present right away. First, Mrs. Clyde Wallace, an experienced business communication specialist on a global scale, as she work, worked among others for Coca-Cola Company, managing a wide range of communication programs in Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific. She has a special passion for cultural heritage, um, our, which is our shared stories, and uh, using her expertise in business communication, sustainability, and information public policy to engage stakeholders in heritage projects. Clyde established her independent consulting business in 2001. Also, Mr. Harris Yampanis is the CEO of Benaki Museum, one of the biggest private museums in Greece with many departments and an exceptional work in the last few decades. Mr. Siabanis has done post postgraduate studies in Tufts University and Harvard University. Last but not least, Dr. Stefanos Valianatos is the head of the International Relations Department of the Hellenic Foundation of, for Culture, and he's also head of the National Network of Anna Lind Foundation in Greece. So, so thank you all to be with us. To begin. My pleasure. To begin, I will ask you to make a five minutes introductory statement related to the topic of our discussion. And after that, we will proceed with the questions, some of them from our audience. So please, Mrs. Aramian, Clay, let's begin with you. Great, thanks very much. <clears throat> um, uh, so I, as you say, I come from the world of corporate uh, communications, corporate CSR. I then got a degree at the Institute of Archaeology, and um, but I came to it with that business background and with a Fletcher background. So it was a little bit uh, coming from a very different angle than a lot of people there. So that's but that CSR background is really how I'm going to approach this. Um, I talk a little bit about um, basically private, se private sector interaction with heritage, not talking so much about museums. We have the CEO of Benaki Museum here. Her you know, museums are a different case. I think that, you know, they're, they're purpose built for public interaction and for a variety of reasons, uh, perhaps there's a, an easier fit with business collaborations. But private sector interaction with types of heritage that are in situ, if you will, whether it's archeological sites, built structures, antiquities or traditional practices is more problematic, I think. And it has a checkered history, as one author put it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, I'm also talking about businesses as opposed to private foundations. There are a lot of private foundations out there um, that, that support heritage in, in a myriad of ways. But I'm interested in whether, whether and how commercial interests can be aligned uh, with heritage conservation. 
um, a broad question I'd like to ask, I won't have time to answer entirely here, is whether or not the discussion, the global dialogue around corporate social responsibility and sustainability presents untapped opportunities for more and better private sector involvement in cultural heritage. My short answer is yes, I think it does. Um, clearly with um, dwindling state resources, cultural heritage uh, in the early 21st century is under a lot of pressure to find both new sources of funding and meaning actually. Um, and uh, at the same time, there's uh, rapidly growing public interest in cultural heritage. And since the 1990s, at the same time, businesses are under pressure to define their social purpose in society, uh, to ensure responsible, responsible operations, but then to go beyond that with strategic programs to help out with uh, global issues like my old company, Coca-Cola, did with water. Um, and in doing so, to partner with governments and NGOs to get it done and to be accountable to other stakeholders for what they do. So potentially there's a, there's a, a, a matched interest there, yet, uh, cultural heritage really has a very marginal place in global sustainability frameworks, including the UN SDGs, and correspondingly in business sustainability guidelines, even for the sectors that arguably are the, the most involved with heritage, tourism, extractives, and the antiquities trade. Um, some standards have been articulated, but have in many cases not been very effective. And very few companies out there have incorporated cultural heritage into their own sustainability agendas. All of that said, nonetheless, I think the sustainability dialogue has prompted some innovative approaches, both to protect and to support uh, heritage resources. On the protection side, there are many things we can talk about, um, perhaps in the discussion, but I think one interesting uh, advance is with lending criteria by development banks. The World Bank is collaborating with UNESCO on heritage-specific criteria. In 2009, in fact, it was this was instrumental in canceling export credit guarantees for the Elisu Dam project in Turkey because there were no feasible plans uh, for salvaging a 10,000-year-old uh, city on the Tigris. It was there called Hasan Kaif. Also, within the World Bank family, the IFC has drawn up performance standards, and interestingly, they have eight standards, and an entire one of those is devoted to cultural heritage, which is very unusual in this field, and it talks about both protection and equitable sharing of the benefits of heritage, so placing cultural heritage squarely in the context of sustainable communities, which is, is a, a bit rare, actually, and these standards are referred to by private banks, in, uh, including uh, HSBC. So it's an interesting development. So moving from protection, and there are lots of other things to say about that, but moving from that to support. So I think you might be interested in looking at some of the things that are happening out there. So what's happening? What are the leading efforts to engage the private sector in heritage conservation? How is it evolving in the sustainability context? Um, well, I looked at this about 15 years ago, and I have to say it hasn't changed a whole lot. There are two main NGOs out there channeling uh, at a global level, channeling private sector funds and partnerships to cultural heritage, and that's the World Monuments Fund and the Global Heritage Fund, based in New York and in California. And they are backed primarily by two companies, by American Express, it's been there since the beginning, uh, and now by Google. Um, the World Monuments Fund was the first, it's still the biggest. Um, they preserved, worked on preserving more than 600 sites and raised or leveraged more than $700 million for uh, site conservation. The primary sponsor since 1995 has been American Express. They are, together, these are the doyens of private sector support at a global level for cultural heritage. Um, the approach of the World's Monument Fund perhaps reflects uh, its, um, its longevity. It's grounded primarily in tradi the traditional focus on material conservation which um, I think you can see in its response to what's just happened with the Hagia Sophia. They put out a statement uh, saying that they don't, you know, it doesn't matter to us whether this is a mosque, or basically saying whether this is a mosque or a, or, or a museum, as long as the, the fabric of the building is not, uh, is not harmed, damaged in any way, and there's continued public access. Um, so that's the doyen, if you will. Uh, the Upstart is an organization called the Global Heritage Fund. It's based in California. It was just set up in 2002, so it's probably, it only has 28 projects um, in a handful of countries, but it's very innovative in the approach it takes. In fact, the way it um, describes itself is transforming local communities by investing in heritage. So it kind of turns the thing on its head and looks at heritage protection as a stimulus to social innovation. And they have some very innovative projects uh, for example, in Morocco, where they're, serve, uh, where they're preserving 
a series of granary, ancient granaries um, that were used to store all kinds of valuables by the local Berber tribes there, but not just um, preserving the fabric, but at the same time working with the community. So the community has control of what happens there and to turn traditional uh, products and practices into um, sensitive uh, tourism uh, attractions as well so they can raise money to put back in the preservation. Uh, additionally, they have actually now, because of COVID, they've got something they're calling the Heritage Solidarity, the Global Heritage Solidarity Fund, and they're inviting uh, contributions um, to give immediate support for the people around a couple of selected sites, particularly right now in Colombia, to, um, to help the communities around the sites uh, you know, survive, because basically the sites can't exist without if the communities aren't healthy, and at the same time to diversify out of tourism for the longer term for those communities. So it takes some interesting approaches. Another company, interestingly, talked about Amex is Google. Google is now using um, information technology to digitize collections um, and to bring cultural heritage to people through an arts and culture app. Actually, it's a fun app. I recommend that you, that you download it. Um, and, and also it's used it to help communities monitor and manage the impact of climate change. So it's working, for example, in Rapa Nui, Easter Island, to help the community there monitor the, the damage caused by rising sea levels on the statues. So it's, it, and it's partnering with these organizations and others to, to use its technology for this. Um, one other example is um, BMW, which is uh, more involved in, um, in intercultural dialogue with the UN, which is a project I was involved in, but also in working on intangible heritage in China right now. Um, there's clear, you know, all of these companies clearly have an interest, a business interest in doing these things. In BMW's case, it's a very significant investment they're making in China uh, to produce electric cars. So, um, you know, you can problematize all of this, but that, but they're, and at the same time, they're doing interesting things in the realm of intangible heritage, talking about their audience being the inheritors and trying to um, build new ways to, to make sure that the traditions um, uh, continue. I can mention one other thing while I still have you. Um, at the other end of the private sector spectrum, microfinance. In Mali, in Mali there's a very interesting initiative where, um, where microfinance banks are actually making loans for sustainable small businesses, for small local business, micro businesses, um, using cultural heritage objects as collateral. And of course, Mali is a place where it's been very much, you know, raped of, of many of its movable um, heritage items because they've become emblematic of African uh, culture and African art. Um, so they, they take from the local people, they will take these cultural objects as collateral then they value them based on the histories that the, the individual is able to bring to them. So it actually encourages knowledge and then, um, and then displays those objects in a locally built museum. And then the monies from that get funded back into the her heritage project. So that's another very interesting model that's not corporate, but uh, my, at the microfinance level. I think that's probably all the time I have. I've probably gone over. We can discuss more in conversation. Yes, thank you, Clay. Uh, that was a truly a global view on the subject. Um, I will um, immediately uh, pass to Mr. Siambanis to give us uh, his view, uh, I presume in a more local uh, aspect, Mr. Siambanis. Thank you very much. Um, uh, first, I would like to uh, say a few words about the Benaiki for those ones uh, they are not aware of. Uh, the Benaiki is, is a foundation under private law uh, it's the largest and oldest private museum in Greece, second most visited after uh, the Acropolis Museum. It uh, was founded in 1930 by Adonis Benakis, who was a Greek of diaspora from Alexandria, uh, to, uh, to house his extensive collections, uh, which he donated to the Greek state. So this was the first, uh, let's say, uh, public-private partnership for the Benakis Museum. Um, Currently, the Benaiki Museum uh, has 10 buildings open to the public, and its collections uh, span from Greek to Islamic and the Chinese, Korean, African, pre-Columbian art, modern art, uh, more than uh, 120,000 uh, artifacts. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, we are able to exhibit only 6%, 6 of them, uh, which makes relevant uh, why we should uh, collaborate with uh, 
uh, with the private sector in order to make this accessible to the whole world. Apart from the extensive collections, the museum also houses four archives, uh, photographic, uh, historical, architectural, and performing arts archive. Uh, the largest museum library in Greece with more than 200,000 volumes and seven specialized conservation laboratories. Every year, approximately one, 900 objects from our collection travel to exhibitions abroad, and we already, we already have established a long-term relationship with uh, the Hellenic Museum uh, in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, we were the first museum to open a shop in Greece and the first uh, to open a, a cafe restaurant and to organize educational programs uh, for the children. Uh, our Museum of Islamic Art is uh, the only one in Balkans and uh, it's among the top 10 collections of the world. So how, how is the Benaki uh, working to preserve uh, the cultural heritage? Um, we are focused on the preservation of cultural heritage through the conservation, documentation, study and exhibition of the objects uh, from our collection. Uh, as Clyde mentioned before about uh, the, the digitization of our archives from Google, uh, we are participating in Google Art Project, so we are, we are one of their partners. So we make accessible uh, all over the world uh, to, to showcase actually uh, our collections. Uh, through our temporary exhibitions, we showcase uh, the work of new and established artists, and we bring our audience, our audience in contact uh, with different cultures. Uh, through our, our educational programs, we bring children, adults, and individuals with disabilities in contact with our collections and cultural heritage in general. Uh, we organize around the year tours of the collections, uh, temporary exhibitions and archives, uh, and most important, in order to do all that, we are working hard to raise funds, uh, both by uh, public and private sector. Uh, fixed up chain, um, the Greek crisis uh, that was uh, before the pandemic was also uh, very critical in order to shape uh, the future of uh, the Greek museums. Uh, and as a result, we had to alternate our, our operating model and going from uh, a state funding model to a more uh, private funding and earned income uh, model. Um, so in order to do that, um, uh, we launched, uh, we used the best practices from all over the world, uh, especially the, the U.S. museums, they are, uh, um, they are the leaders on, uh, on this area. Uh, so we, we created individual and corporate memberships uh, we tried to make uh, tailor-made solutions for corporates in order to become relevant uh, for their CSR and for their uh, causes. Uh, we created an, ad an adoptions program. Uh, I'm proud enough to, to tell you that uh, 18 of our employees are being adopted. I am one of them. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we introduced an end-of-the-year appeal. Uh, we introduced annual galas, uh, fundraising events, um, we include in our agreements with corporate uh, partners uh, in-kind support. Um, we try to use uh, all our venues for, uh, uh, for corporate rentals. And we try to fundraise not, not only in Greece, but uh, in all over the world. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we, we did the huge uh, preparatory work uh, in order to be uh, more transparent and simple than ever. Uh, so we are proud enough of having um, audited the financial statements uh, in English based on uh, international financial reporting standards, uh, which is not the standard practice for, uh, for a Greek uh, nonprofit. Um, we have developed uh, an ERP and business intelligence uh, system. Uh, we already have e-ticketing. Uh, it might sound uh, uh, very naive, maybe to some other museums, but uh, in the Greek environment, this is not. Uh, we don't take this for granted. Uh, and coming to to COVID nineteen, uh, we had to face a new crisis after eight years of the Greek economic crisis, uh, which practically um, without all our earned income, uh, we remained closed uh, for three months. Uh, we had to suspend uh, our, uh, our one-third of our employees 
We had to give them new tasks, uh, but our financial obligations remained the same. Uh, having said that, um, we tried to create some new sources of revenues like uh, ESOP sales, book bazaars, uh, the Nike emergency uh, fund campaign, uh, but our uh, our job became uh, more difficult than ever because the focus uh, was, as it ought to be, uh, in the health sector, uh, in uh, in facilities and in hospitals, and all the interest uh, went to to that side. Um, however, uh, we understand uh, the culture uh, as uh, not as a luxury but as something that uh, will show us uh, the way forward, as uh, in all these years uh, presents uh, the way and our footprint in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in this earth uh, before we come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it is very interesting. From my position as a Greek, I know that uh, the work of uh, the Nike Museum is very prominent uh, in, uh, in uh, this country. But of course, uh, to pass to Mr. Valianatos, I must say that uh, also the Hellenic Foundation for, for Culture uh, is um, also doing a great job and also having a, a strong international presence. Uh, uh, there are some uh, departments in uh, Alexandria, Egypt, or uh, Belgrade, or Berlin, etc. But uh, Mr. Valianatos, Dr. Valianatos, uh to tell us more about that thank you very much and thank you for hosting me for this very interesting and uh, i would say um, enlightening and also stimulating uh discussion um the way you have that you introduced me is very interesting because it used by of, uh, by being uh, uh, the head of the international relations department of the hellenic foundation of culture but also representative of the Annalen foundation i mentioned that because there are two different trends here which are very interesting, and uh, including other institutions like uh, the European Union, National Institute of Culture, the Alliance of Civilizations. So this is, uh, um, in a way, some would argue that this is an anomaly, something like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In what sense? Um, maybe just for the uh, sake of the audience is that we would like, I would like to uh, underline that what we call cultural heritage, it's the result of human activity. And in that respect, uh, um, we, if you take it a little bit further, we might say that it's, uh, it's the legacy of a group or society um, uh, which are inherited from the past generation, but what we consider as, as the cultural heritage of a society, of a group, of a state, it has gone through a selective process, something that would allow us to uh, create a very solid identity and a very coherent and very tangible and unfortunately and this is where my political science background comes in something that would differentiate from the other in that respect uh, the current uh, view for a long time and this is what gave rise to institutions like the hellenic foundation of culture is the result of the contemporary state system worldwide which is the national state system and therefore we tend to identify we tend to identify the cultural heritage of a national state system, of, an, of a nation state, of a state, as something unique, as something um, um, fragmented from the rest of it. Whereas, um, as we all know, the, the contemporary state system, but any state system in the past, it's an artificial creation. And societies are dynamic, are movable, they are changeable, and therefore, um, what we consider today as a cultural heritage of a, a group of society, or especially the state, it is not necessarily the one which was considered some years ago, but also even today we see a new approach to what we consider. For the sake of argument, if you ever go to Brussels, go and visit the African Museum. And it's very interesting because they are trying to incorporate two different things. On the one hand, the uh, imperial past of Belgium, but at the same time, trying to incorporate it in a more, shall I say, politically correct approach. And therefore, this illustrates that what we consider and what is the uh, cultural heritage, it's also a dynamic domain, but it's also a source of learning. Uh, just being an example that we can learn a lot from preservation, not only of monuments, but of, uh, of food, of uh, environmental issues, and so on and so forth, that we get out of it. And also, it becomes uh, instrumental in a way uh, for sustainable economic development. And, and this is what brings me into the other 
the other two institutions, because by recognizing those what we consider as national or ethnic cultural heritage um, expressions, by the way, I just want to make a small uh, parenthesis here and say, even though we tend to recognize the tangible vis-a-vis -vis the intangible expression of that, even the tangible ones tend to be an expression of the intangible um, values and norms and uh, practices and way of life uh, that has existed in the past and the main ideas that existed. So the division of that is essential, but nevertheless, in, in many cases, they are completely interrelated. And therefore, the division, would, the, the, the separation would not make sense if you want to, to understand the complete one. So while this one, the institution like mine developed in order to promote uh, the national history, culture, relate and history, culture, uh, language, and so on and so forth. Now, gradually, all of them, including the Hellenic Foundation, have moved on and being part of the international community from, um, shall we say, a nationalistic approach to the dialectic approach. So suddenly we have an inclusion, which become an essential parameter of dialogue. And therefore, it's not only promoting the cultural, uh, for promoting our national culture and our national head and cultural heritage, but also the cultural dialogue and cultural relations with the other institutions, with the other countries and other societies as, as such. At the, in addition to that, uh, we have recognized that states are not monolithic and there are divisions within which are related with, to different approaches from, and, uh, and diversity becomes the rule rather than the exception. And therefore, we moved on to um, the establishment of institutions the, the, like the Annelie Foundation, the Alliance of Civilization, even the Council of Europe includes such programs, which actually promotes the dialogue, the dialogue between cultures. And in that respect, the cultural heritage becomes a space of dialogue rather than competition. Just doing, going back in time, we will recognize, and we, can, we have seen that in the Balkans a lot, or even vis-a-vis -vis Turkey, that um, expression of, of, of cultural expression of cultural heritage that we consider as Greek, they have been contested as others. And I, wanna, I don't want to use any politically uh, highlighted um, uh, expressions, but I would take an example which is very popular among Greeks, Rebetico music. You finally, you, you, one of the songs, for instance, you will find that is contested by the Serbs, by the Bulgarians, by the Turks and the Greeks, and therefore, this is the negative side of it, but on the other hand, you can see the positive side of it is a place of dialogue, of cooperation, of, uh, of, um, of uh, working together in order to overpass the, uh, the, the um, points of friction in order to uh, contribute to a peaceful coexistence. Of course, it's also a, a very important domain in terms of sustainable development and um, of, of developing in such, and therefore uh, we have the expression not only of uh, creative industries and creative um, entrepreneurship over there, but also that touches upon, and I think even though um, um, Mrs. Wallace had described it, probably a lot within the, pro within the CSR domain, we see that in, uh, the do in the community of the social entrepreneurship, the cultural as well as the environmental elements are essential. And, um, and in that respect, uh, as a general trend, the other institution that the Hellenic Foundation is very active, which is the, the European Union's National Institute for Culture, which is not an institution of the European Union. It's an initiative by the state members, where, whereas initially they were perceived as active in the cultural diplomacy, now they prefer the word of uh, cultural relations. And even, um, uh, even the European Union has introduced no, a new notion of culture where it's much wider to include, uh, to include um, cultural heritage in order to include uh, sustainable development in order to improve relations. And in that respect, uh, it becomes essential for any policy, whether it's of a private company or of a state or a community, if it wants to build relations or if it wants to be um, relevant to what's going on, that any cultural programs, any activities that such institution would be, will be in good cooperation with the local entities. So therefore, understanding the other perspective, which is the cultural domain, and that becomes essential for this um, successful or sustainable action of those institutions. And hopefully that would gradually move on into a better understanding. On the other hand, in cases like Hagia Sophia or other ones, we can see that um, um, 
the cultural the cultural heritage becomes a place of uh, friction or a place of uh, as a threat. And in that respect, we've seen in some cases, I don't want to mention, uh, in some cases of uh, um, uh, radical expression or extremist expression, their attempts to um, to uh, destroy and uh, wipe out the expression of uh, of pre-existing cultures in order to do, in order to maintain or in order to uh, dominate the uh, the narrative through their own culture. So, uh, as a nutshell, it's a wide range of institutions where there is a lot of uh, space for cooperation, and then because of the social entrepreneurship element, but because of the um, um, the um, the dynamic. And the variety of expression, I wanted to dig into the discussion, the importance of uh, civil society as a free, as a as an area and as an active, as a third pillar to the private vis-a-vis -vis the private sector domain and cooperation. In which case, um, you create a, a triangle, which is, if working together, it might be extremely productive and extremely efficient, and uh, it is a sort of uh, hope not necessarily, not always very, very uh, extremely hopeful because if civil society as such is still a reflection of the societies at large. I'll stop here and I hope we'll have uh, space for a little discussions. Uh, thank you so much. So uh, the question is now that if private sector uh, can act as a catalyst between nations uh, in order to promote peace. Um, uh, as like you said, uh, Dr. Valenatos, um, in cases like uh, Yasofya, uh, how, how can uh, uh, private uh, companies or entities or uh, even the civil uh, society um, can uh, work in this, uh, in this aspect? Uh, Mrs. Wallace, uh, what do you think about that? Well, I, um, I actually um... Uh, worked with the, you just uh, mentioned it, Mr. Valianatos, I, I worked with the UN Alliance of Civilizations to produce a report on the contribution of the private sector to multicultural understanding. And I, I would say, looking at that, that, um, I mean, in, I think in broad, sort of in principle, you can say that the private sector, for all the ways you can problematize its motives, um, you know, because it has a uh, because it's trying to make money, because it's not a government, it's less invested in some ways in some of the identity competitions that you were talking about. And I think there is room for the private sector to have a positive role in, in that regard. Um, and uh, in fact, you see some companies trying to contribute to that, like BMW, um, uh, where they actually are supporting, they invented something called the cultural, um, Intercultural Understanding uh, Innovation Award in conjunction with the UNAOC. And it's all about fun finding and then funding grassroots initiatives by, by young people mainly um, that are designed to, um, to um, you know, overcome cultural, you know, this, this, the dialogue of difference, if you will, you know, the, um, and, and create dialogue between cultures. Get, um, and it's, uh, so there are companies that have an interest in that. Um, you also see small private sector initiatives. There's a small company called, it's called, oh, I think it's called Food for Peace that works in Israel, that works in bringing Israeli and Palestinian small businesses together to produce uh, food um, in order. It's just, it's, it's one step towards, you know, people as a tourism industry would say, it's, you know, you encounter each other. As, as you work together to, to achieve a goal, including a profit goal, um, you know, cultural differences are irrelevant to that. And uh, as you work together and, you know, the, the other becomes, instead of becoming an enemy, becomes a partner. And uh, so that initiative has been going on for some time. Uh, there are a no, number of other examples from this report. I'm going to have to think for a second to bring some of them up. Um, but I do think that there is a potentially natural role for the private sector. Um, to, over, to help overcome in some situations those differences. There are also problems. There's one, there was one example of a mine in Indonesia um, where uh, they were having uh, trouble with the local community that didn't trust them. And basically they took a year or two year program together to educate both the, um, the for, you know, their 
the, the international workers who had come in and the local community about each other's habits. And for example, um, uh, you know, the need for the Muslims, for the Indonesian Muslims, um, for their need for prayer and their cultural um, traditions, that kind of thing. And it was a, a one, two year investment in a process of mutual understanding ended up, ended up making a, a huge difference. The mine was going to have to close because of these differences. And indeed it ended up being a thriving, a thriving place. So um, there, I think there is potential for the private sector to do that. But uh, is there any need for, for, for guidance from uh, oh, yeah. institutions or, or from, oh. from governments in order to bring together these individual uh, private sector efforts? What do you think, Mr. Siambanis? I think we, ha we have to get examples uh, from, uh, from already existing partnerships uh, and the role of cultural diplomacy uh, should be upgraded in, in many aspects. Um, judging for myself, uh, and it's not because of my profession, uh, when I visit uh, a foreign country, uh, one of the first things that I'm trying to do is to visit, to visit the museum or to visit uh, to visit the place that uh, uh, gives the, the footprint of, of their ancestors. Uh, what I'm trying to, to, to see there is not what they did, but the way they, they used to think about, about things. Um, I, ca I, can, I can claim some, some exams from, from our museum. Uh, I can see um, a, a great exhibition that uh, took place uh, last year, uh, which was the Roads of, Ar the Roads of Arabia. Uh, and, and it was an exhibition sponsored fully by, by Saudi Aramco. So uh, imagine that is, uh, is a, a, a very big company outside Greece, Middle East, uh, supporting an exhibition in Greece about Islamic art. And that way makes accessible and relevant uh, great things from the Islamic, uh, from the Islamic nations and Islamic art uh, that are relevant to the people here, and in that way, can educate people about the way that they they operate. Um, another another great thing that I can I can think about is that we run a program which was support uh, which was supported by a big corporate here in Greece and supporting uh, refugees uh, visits in our exhibitions. So in that way, uh, people from Syria uh, and people from Afghanistan. Uh, could visit exhibitions of Benaki and educate they, themselves about the new country that uh, they have they have get into it. Um, another great thing is uh, the Benaki presence in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I know that some of you will claim that Melbourne is the third the third biggest city of Greece, but uh, on the other hand, uh, Melbourne is not only Greeks. Uh, there are people from uh, from Asia, people from Australia, people from all over the world that they can visit and educate themselves about um, the Greek and not only the Greek culture. Uh, another thing is that uh, Benaki owns a Chinese collection. Now we're trying to find a home for this Chinese collection and we're trying to, uh, to educate people about Chinese art. Um, I'm, be I'm becoming specific about, uh, about Benaki because Benaki owns uh, a span of different collections, not only Greek collections. And in that way, uh, promotes, as uh, Mr. Vallanatos uh, mentioned before, promotes dialogue between cultures. And I think this is the only way that we can understand other people and uh, promote uh, peace, uh, promote friendship, and respect about others' rights. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, but okay. then, again, is there a need uh, of a governmental or a um, uh, more institutional guidance for these efforts or not? Perhaps can I just give a quick example of that? I think if it's certainly a case in, uh, in a case of cultural heritage, for example, um, one of the, the biggest industries that gets involved with heritage in situ is the mining industry. And um, because they, they go in and they're, you know, in digging, digging, they dig up uh, heritage sites. And um, in 2003, the International Council of Mining and Metals actually came up with a, a commitment for UNE to UNESCO. They called it a no-go commitment, where they would never go on to World Heritage Sites, would never operate in World Heritage Sites or it, in a dangerous vicinity of them. And just in 2000, but, in, but, but the problem was that a lot of that wasn't 
that commitment wasn't then reflected in national legislation very well. In 2013, the UNESCO called on national governments to, try, to, to put that, reflect that commitment in national legislation. And for example, in Western Australia, where there are a lot of Aboriginal sites, there is a law um, uh, that says that that shouldn't happen. But just last month, there were massive protests in Western Australia because both Rio Tinto and BHP Billiton had just gone in um, and dug up, uh, you know, many, many different sites without they, even after having gone through the approval process because the law in Australia wasn't strong enough to prevent that. So I, in my, from my perspective, I think the, the private sector has has the potential to do good, good things, but it absolutely requires the participation of governments to encourage and in some case legislate to make sure that it's, that it's done. Mm -hmm. Dr. Valenatos, do you have a comment on that? Well, uh, you, bring, you bring on an element which can have ideological parameters, is whether we have a liberal approach to the, state, the role of the state or an interventionist approach. So uh, I guess, um, Living here in Europe, I will approach it in the, from the European perspective of liberalism in a way. So, of course, there is a role there. But the state remains um, a space of competition of different lobbies and different interests and in that respect. Uh, but also, it's the only institution that can provide and legislate and put actually the overall picture. But this is why uh, we cannot actually... Um, um, isolate the state from the rest of the institution that we have already been mentioned here, the private sector and the civil society, because this is a continuous process for, for, with regard to all of them. Uh, each one has its role to play, and personally I think that the guidance, I'm not very, I wouldn't be so, so much in favor of guidance per se, as uh, I would like to see the state as providing the overall framework with a very, of course, a framework that has to be flexible because it will always have to adapt to the new conditions and then allow for the uh, creative uh, power of the civil society and of the private sector to emerge in accordance with this one. Now, in terms of guidance, this might not, you might approach it as a, as an, as a state institution or not. There are the know-how, there, there is a lot of know-how, there is a capacity worldwide in, in different international institutions, in different uh, uh, private or uh, civil society organizations that exist over there. And, and it is, that's why uh, we are all, I'm always uh, encouraging the idea of like, getting involved, being platforms, being networks, because this is where you will get all the knowledge required and all the, um, all the uh, even access to funding that is not available always. And and this is the last point I want to make with, in, in relation to the state. Of course, as I've said, the state is essential. But remember, the, fund, the, uh, the, uh, the funds available from the state have to operate in competition to other sectors. So the cultural heritage, cultural education, justice, health, all of them compete for a very limited um, uh, pool of resources. And this is, why, this is why all the other practices are essential because it actually, if the private sector and the civil society and all the dynamism and the creative approach they have can be at the, uh, at the, um, uh, at the hands of the cultural uh, sector or the cultural heritage sector, it actually uh, um, frees capital from the state that can be used uh, elsewhere, which are also reflected in the uh, cultural heritage. If um, I'm just taking as an example, I found very interesting. It might be an oversimplification. Uh, which took place uh, during the crisis. It was a different approach during the coronavirus crisis. If you remember very well the Greeks I meant, when uh, the, uh, the leading personality that was uh, uh, talked about and that uh, a lot of them argued that, well, we shouldn't make such a fuss because some old people would die. The reaction was a cultural expression. No, they are our parents or this one or the other. Whereas in, whereas in Belgium as well as in Sweden, the, uh, the, the social distancing was part of the culture and actually failed to, to, uh, to produce the results. And not only that, in I think in Belgium, the, uh, the number of casualties raised afterwards when they realized that there were a lot of casualties in uh, pensions and in, um, uh, in old houses, in people, in, uh, in, in houses where old people live because this uh, family bond, which is 
very much present in the Mediterranean was not over there. So we see that this cultural element becomes essential as uh, a glue that would uh, connect to many different things. Yes, uh, <clears throat> this brings me to, to uh, another uh, current uh, issue um, about the cultural heritage pre pre pres preservation um, contributing to sustainable communities. Uh, actually, this is a question uh, from Professor Pogrom, um, which is relating to, to communities that may be displaced uh, due to due climate disruption or, uh, or migration or war. How will uh, displaced communities find new ways to sustain their, their culture? Uh, I mean, can they do it by themselves? Uh, which is the role of uh, private sector on that? Which is the role of governments? Mm -hmm. Who wants to comment? In, in my, uh, man, yes, uh, in, my, in my view, uh, the displaced, uh, 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 let's say, communities, um, they should be uh, helped uh, by, uh, by a number of, uh, of factors. Uh, one of those is obviously private sector because they don't have the funds in order to do the things they, they want. Uh, the other one is the governmental sector because uh, the governmental sector should provide initiatives for the private sector in order to provide the funds. So uh, uh, in my view, it's, it's a cycle. Uh, it's a cycle of, uh, of uh, contribution uh, and the people uh, that should be uh, partnering in order to, to create a sustainable communities. Let's say, um, I, I take for example Greece. Uh, Greece, uh, 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 th there is no place in Greece without the cultural heritage. Uh, we, we can go in, in place in Greece, uh, find the communities that they are displaced. Um, they can, we can have companies there invest in those communities. Uh, we can have the government provide initiatives for those corporates in order to invest in these communities and we can have local uh, uh, local museums or local uh, uh, archaeologists or local people with know-how of the area in order to provide the know-how that they need to. Uh, for instance, we can go uh, to a place and create uh, a hotel uh, for the visitors of the uh, cultural uh, sightseeing of the area. Um, we, we have seen that in, uh, in some areas. I know that there is one uh, preparing now in Sparta, and uh, in my point of view, this would be a great example uh, that uh, they can follow uh, other partners as well uh, in all over the world. Ty, do you want to say something? I see that you. Oh, well, I just I think it's a fascinating question, actually, what displays people, what you do with people who've had to, to with migrants and people who've been displaced. There's I, um, I think that's a very interesting uh, answer. I just have one uh, example. There's a uh, of trying to highlight uh, uh, those people in um, in Toronto, the Aga Khan Museum has worked with the Luciano Benetton Foundation um, on an exhibit called Don't Ask Me Where I'm From. It's just being exhibited on the po it's really on the post migrant experience, the second generation migrants and talking about their experience. So it's, I just thought it was an interesting example of, of somebody that's at least for the foundation end of the private sector, trying to give voice to to people who've been displaced, even if uh, that in that case, it's it's um, second generation, but there might be room for more creative uh, uh, projects like that to give voice to to people who've been displaced. I can add, um, first of all, I'm a little bit skeptical uh, with, uh, with the, this notion, in what sense? Um, when we have a displaced uh, population uh, now, whether are we talking about people that will manage one day to go back to their, um, to their place of origin, are we talk, or are we going to talk about refugees and immigrants, which inevitably, in the long run, they will be integrated in the local communities and in the, in the, in the, state, in the, in the hosting states. So this is a little bit uh, tricky of how do we, do, we, do, we, do we deal with it. But in any case, I just want to give an example 
Uh, first of all, including the Council of Europe has come up with a project which of course had more to do with integration of those communities locally rather than with uh, maintaining by maintaining the um, the cultural heritage of the uh, of the displaced people. But nonetheless, it's based on the intercultural dialogue. This is called intercultural cities, and in in in, in the nutshell, is that the coexist the, co the coexistence of different cultures in the same space, and therefore the need for each one of them to maintain its own culture. So therefore, there's a, and and the important the interesting thing about this project is that it's tailor made according to each city. It's not a take it or leave it uh, guideline. It is, it is designed in, uh, between the Council of Europe and the, each city, uh, in particular to meet the needs of the city. In the case of Greece, Patra is one of them. Now, I have another two examples that, um, of course, they are not major uh, in the inside, but definitely are in that direction. One of them came from a social entrepreneur in Sweden, a lady actually, who combined the two. And this is where I'm, I'm mentioning that the creative industries and the creative thinking are essential in that in that perspective. She, as a lady, came up with the idea of uh, making um, handmade uh, bags, and those bags, and she trained other women to do that. But those bags were not ordinary bags; they reflected their culture, their cultural heritage, their history, and they became extremely popular. And therefore, she, not only she became a successful businessman, but uh, entrepreneur, I would prefer, but she trained a number of generations to do that. Mm -hmm. And the other one is something which is not, it becomes more and more the case, is the, the, um, the, the creation of uh, museums which are addressing this issue, like in uh, Kreuzberg in, 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 in Berlin or in Marseille or in Malta. So that where this notion maintains alive, and in other cases, I think in Berlin or in other countries, we see that um, um, those displaced or immigrants or refugees are the ones who are trained to become uh, narrators or um, uh, guided tools, therefore presenting, having the opportunity to present the history and the culture of their host country, nonetheless from their own perspective, and therefore being able to also illustrate their own approach and, uh, and their, not only their own approach, but their own uh, cultural history and background. And therefore, they become financially sustainable, but at the same time, they have an opportunity uh, to maintain their, their bond and contact and actually uh, an opportunity to outreach this, um, um, those memories in threat to the rest of the population, which in the long run, hopefully, would create a very favorable audience and therefore a pressure group towards uh, the aim that uh, we all would like to see. Well, thank you. But let me ask one more question, which is, I think, relevant. Uh, we, we are now after two consecutive crises, one the financial crisis, which began in 2008, and the COVID-19 COVID uh, crisis that is uh, evolving. Uh, under these circumstances, which are the margins for funding uh, for cultural heritage? And where should be targeted this, this funding, in your opinion? Uh, which, which are the priorities in that matter? Uh, Clyde, let's begin with you again. I think you it might be a good idea to uh, begin with Mr. <laughs> um, Siampanis from Benaki, because I think you've dealt with that very directly with the museum, yes? Yeah, I can, I can do that. Um, I think that um, this is this is a very uh, a very difficult uh, era for uh, for museums uh, in general and for cultural institutions and for non-profit institutions, uh, uh, more generally speaking. Um, first of all, uh, we need to have an environment uh, that uh, motivates and provides initiatives to corporates uh, in order to support. Uh, I, I will give you an example which uh, uh, it might sound funny, uh, but uh, it's very serious. Um, a Greek resident uh, when give uh, a donation or a Greek corporate to the Benaki Museum, this is non-tax deductible. A U.S. resident can give a can give a donation to the Benaki Museum, and this is tax deductible. Um, that's, as you understand, might sound funny, but it's, it's very serious uh, 
because all our donors from US, they take a tax deduction for donations to the Benaki because we have a 501c3 account in US and we are recognizable as, uh, as a non-profit institution. While in Greece, they actually have um, a penalty of 0.5% of the donation that uh, we are ashamed to ask this from the donor and we deduct from the donation we provided this to the IRS. Um, that being said, I mean, uh, I know that we have two different models in Europe and US. Uh, Europe is mostly uh, state funding uh, for nonprofits, while US is more uh, privately funding. Uh, but in order for the governments to to reduce funds to the nonprofit institutions, they need on the other side to increase initiatives and uh, make it easier for the corporates to support them. Um, this is this is my point of view. Um, I know that uh, it, it's a very difficult time for all of us, but we need to make it easy. We need to make it simple, and we need and we need leaders in this in these industries uh, to lead by example. Um, we have seen that by great great uh, private foundations such as Stavros Niarchos, Latsis, Bodosakis. Uh, but we need more initiative from the government and more corporates to lead by example and uh, make it easy for them to support nonprofits. Uh, I have one question for Mrs. Wallace from uh, our audience, uh, which I'm, uh, I will read right now. Uh, can you provide some more examples of how large corporations are introducing cultural heritage into their corporate social responsibility practices? Um, yes, I see the question. And, um, um, and also about um, what the impact is of not having it included in the UN Sustainability Development Goals. Um, the, uh, there are not many companies uh, that uh, include that have cultural heritage as a focus of their sustainability goals. I mean, one thing that's happened with the whole sustainability dialogue is that um, a lot of companies have moved not entirely, but have partway moved away from a philanthropic model to a model where they need to define what their social role is in society, and then most of the money that they give needs to fall within that. And there are not many companies that have chosen uh, cultural heritage. In fact, I would say that uh, primary ones are uh, American Express and Google, um, and, that, and, and to B BMW to uh, another extent. Um, it, it's, it's still the case that both with, and you know, that happens because companies are responding to the public um, demand. So, um, and then in the public level, in the UN sustainability goals, if the, if the, focus, if the focus is on the, squarely on the environment, in addition to that is, you know, as well as uh, human rights, um, you know, poverty alleviation, health, and uh, corruption to a certain extent. And um, uh, there, in fact, in the UN Sustainability Goals, there is a, a minor reference to cultural heritage. It's goal 4.11.1, I think it is. And it basically refers to both cultural and natural heritage, the importance of preserving both. And then the actual goal, the actual action, is to increase funding both by the public and the private sector. So it's not at all focused really on heritage or any, any particular standards. So it's, it's not a focus there. And because it isn't a focus there, it isn't going to be a big focus with, with companies. Um, and I, so I do think that that does have um, implications for private sector funding. And I think one thing that in, in the, over the longer term, I think there are a number of things that the heritage sector can do to, an, to increase uh, private sector funding. And one of them is a lot, the long-term project of, of um, getting heritage and cultural issues and cultural heritage included in a, in a vision of a sustainable future. And which it just, it, it's, it's only at very, very much at the margins of that. And I, I think um, I study political science as well. And I would say that the, um, you know, there are reasons for that. I think both the heritage community and the, and the development community are grounded in material concerns. You know, mm -hmm. perhaps in Maslow's hierarchy, perhaps that makes sense. They're concerned with making sure that people are fed and healthy and the whole notion of identity, um, you know, psychological and social well-being is just not integrated into, into these things very well. So um, 
In answer to the first question, I'm not sure I have, I can talk to you if you want a little bit more about the, what um, Amex or what uh, Google or, uh, or what the uh, Global Heritage Fund is doing, if you want more examples of that. But other than those two or three companies, there isn't a lot. Some of the mining companies, you know, the, the, you know in this context, it's the companies, the companies will do it if it's something that's either directly related to their business, like American Express is being a travel, uh, f uh, travel finance company, um, Google because IT can bring that heritage to you, um, BMW because it was investing in China, um, or it's because they, um, you know, they could damage heritage and it could cause reputational damage, so it's a danger they need to insure against. And that's where the, the extractives come in. Um, but even the extractives don't really have a lot of, there are a few local initiatives, but they, they really do not uh, invest in it on a global basis. They have global standards, but then standards that they are not always complying with. So, um, so I, I agree that it's, it's problematic at that point. I hope that helps. I see it does. Okay, good. <laughs> so uh, in concluding this, uh, this uh, discussion, uh, I, I want to ask one final question and let you make a small final uh, statement, uh, each one of you. And the question is, how can this view of the, the, the private sector on uh, cultural heritage can, can change or can be better? Uh, so uh, let's uh, keep uh, the same orders. Uh, Clay, if you would okay. like to <laughs> make right. a final well, statement. Well, I think um, I've, I've said part of it, actually. Um, but I think, um, I mean, there are, first of all, there are things that the business can offer. It can offer not just money, it can offer, um, you, know, rel you know, relevant skills, employees, it, marketing, the power of the brand, and it can also help in advocacy. So I think their business, the private sector, it, it, I, I mean, businesses, there are things that they can contribute. There are lots of challenges. The lead times of dealing with a company, the management demands, potentially the inconsistency and the need to show results are all something that don't, fit very well with right now with how heritage is, is managed in a lot of places, at least non-museum heritage I'm talking about. Um, so I think there's, there, what the heritage can, sector can do is, is a few things. And one is at the local level, um, enhancing management capacity to deal with the private sector. Um, and perhaps what you're saying, Mr. Stampanis, as well, the, 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 you know, the public sector to facilitate it better as well. Um, and, and to learn how to target if the right kinds of partnerships to do the right kinds of things, and then to enhance standards of behavior, both at the project level, so that, that you know, helping, you know, train, if you will, heritage managers to do that, but then also at the global level to advocate. There's a, I think there's a big advocacy job uh, to be done um, at national, international level to bring uh, heritage to the attention of the public authorities and then the private sector. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Mr. Ziabans? Um, I would say that uh, we all have to, to do our own job uh, and uh, we have to do our part, the part that uh, comes to us. Um, if I had to summarize all of this, I would say uh, become more relevant. Um, and by saying that, I mean that uh, you can have corporate, uh, uh, corporate support and this is not only money. Uh, it can be services that they are expensive for you. Uh, they, it can be advice uh, that is also expensive for you. Uh, and people, they can give that, and companies can give that uh, uh, almost for free. Uh, I, will, I will give you two or three examples, and I will, I will uh, close up here. Um, for, for museums, one of, uh, of the, the must-have things is all TV screens, tablets, things that you can market in your, uh, uh, your, uh, your exhibitions, uh, your, uh, the rights to your members, and all of those. But those things are pretty expensive. So what you can do is partnering with uh, a leading, let's say, um, telecom company and provide this for free. Uh, we have done this with Samsung, for example, and uh, this is a pretty, pretty heavy cost that has been uh, deducted from our budget. Uh, another thing for us, which is very expensive, is uh, transferring uh, objects uh, through uh, via uh, via aviation. Uh, we, we have partnering with Aegean Airlines, and almost all all the flights for things and visitors of the museum uh, is is for free. 
Uh, and a last thing about advice is that we very recently introduced uh, a CEO advisor network, uh, which uh, constitutes from uh, people from different industries. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's people with uh, different backgrounds from banking industry, from marketing industry, uh, from politics, um, people who, with total different backgrounds that they can advise me and the museum uh, for things that uh, if we were hiring, let's say, a consulting firm, uh, it would be unsustainable for us. So trying way, trying to find way, trying to find ways to become relevant, and sometimes get services that uh, might may cost you uh, a fortune. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Valenatos. The last word is yours. <laughs> Famous last words, as a super Trump would say. Uh, so, um, well, as I've said, and loyal to what I've said. It's a triangle that all of them have to work in, in as better as possible. The civil society, or shall we say, society at large, with the private sector and the public sector. In that respect, the first one, the first point I want to make is that if we are talking about major um, uh, cultural heritage monuments, uh, they have to become socialized in a way. In, in, in what sense? The 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 the, uh, the, um, the the connection, the bond between the locality and those institutions have to be strengthened because then it becomes part of their life. And once it becomes them, then there is the relevance of the private sector because of the locality. Then um, we have to give, I think in general, the, in terms of the private sector, the, it needs the incentives to do that. And they are not only financial, it's also, um, it's also exactly the uh, employees of the private sector remains locals in a the, certain the degree. And therefore their well-being or the, um, the, uh, the maintenance or the preservation of their, their home environment is essential for their, for their living better in better conditions. And um, finally, and uh, of course, it is uh, something that, um, of course, this role or this behavior of the private sector is different from country to country, from culture to culture. And in that respect, I would argue that probably we need a concentrated campaign, education, so on and so forth, for a mentality change. I'll just give an example, which for me was surprisingly, when I went back and uh, when we were discussing the social entrepreneurship community, we went, we came across um, some of the findings, some of the uh, documents of the Conrad and Howard Stephen Foundation, which is representative of the Conservative Party. It was very interesting to see that from the 50s, uh, one of the major guidelines of such a party, a right-wing party, was the social responsibility of the private sector. That's what this is what I mean in some degree that is um, we need a mentality shift from all sides. And in terms of Greece, as you probably know very well know, is we have to move beyond the demonization of the private sector and the enterprises as such. Um, so this would be essential if we want to move, move ahead and the private sector can offer this thinking out of the box, including when I say the private sector is the, the third sector and others. Uh, but this is a long process, and uh, unless you have um, the state providing the environment a stability in a number of, from investment policies to taxation, and um, knowing the private sector that would, things would not, that taxation would not change overnight, not for the next year, but for the previous year, this cannot be an incentive for the private sector to be involved. And um, just using from a different domain, in terms of going back to the notion of uh, to the mentality change is that probably uh, whether we can manage to switch from profit to uh, um, uh, to uh, ah, I forgot the word uh, switch the word from profit to um, the more wider um, sharing of this profit purpose this <laughs> time so hopefully uh, we will have better times ahead. So uh, this uh, conversation will have a Sorry. truly new From meaning. profit to prosperity. Prosperity, okay. <laughs> anyway, I, on behalf of uh, Dr. Podromu from Tatsu University, and of course of myself, I, I will, uh, I thank you very much thank for you. this uh, thoughtful and uh, very useful uh, conversation. Um, I invite you, uh, if you can, to um, participate in uh, our next panel tomorrow at uh, noon 
um, uh, east time of USA, seven, seven uh, o'clock in the afternoon in Greece. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure. Fly, thank you. Dr. Valianatos, Mr. Siampanis, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you. Real pleasure. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Our pleasure. Keep nice to meet you as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.